Thank you for logging in today to watch our webinar on the freedom of a self-directed IRA. During this presentation, we will go through a lot of the basics as it pertains to IRA accounts, but spend a lot more time specifically on self-directed IRAs, the different rules that are involved, the different types of investments that are possible when you choose to self-direct your IRA account and open up a world of different investment opportunities. My name is Scott Maurer. I'm the Education and Marketing Director for Advanta IRA Services. I'm also a member of the Florida Bar, which gives me a good legal background to discuss a lot of the issues that we'll talk about. But I don't do any legal work for Advanta or for any Advanta clients. I've been with the company now for a number of years, since February of 2006, during which time I've handled numerous transactions on behalf of clients, seen a lot of different things and a lot of different unique uh, investments that people have made, different ways people have structured things, giving me a really good basis for understanding uh, the self-directed IRA investor and a lot of times what people are looking to do with their self-directed IRA account. A quick disclaimer on our services, Advanta does not offer any legal, tax, or investment advice for our clients. Uh, we are not accountants, although again, although I am an attorney, I don't give legal work, I don't do legal work, and I can't give legal advice. Now a lot of the things we'll talk about today have various tax implications, potentially some legal implications as well, and we can give you some different wording, some advice in those areas and kind of give you what the rules may be, but when things go into a gray area or deciding whether or not something is a good or bad idea for you as it pertains to your tax situation or to the particular investment, uh, we do defer to you and your other investor, uh, advisors at that time to determine whether or not an investment makes sense. Our company has been around since 2004. Uh, our only business is handling the administration of self-directed IRAs. We don't handle any personal funds. Uh, we don't perform any other services than this job as an administrator and record keeper. So again, we're not a financial advisor. We're not out there seeking uh, and putting clients into particular investments. We're merely administering the account, what the client brings to us to make as an investment. We do so and just make sure that it gets done properly and handle all the funds going in and out of the IRA account. Our office is owned and managed by a CFP and an attorney, Jack Callahan, although again, Jack does not give financial advice, nor does he give legal advice for clients as well. We really feel one of our biggest advantages in the self-directed IRA world uh, is that we do offer a local feel to our clients, whether you're here uh, in the Tampa Bay area where we're based, or whether you're uh, somewhere else, even maybe in a different time zone, we really feel that you'll get to know who you are, uh, who you're working with, and develop a, a better rapport than maybe dealing with some larger companies where you do just call in uh, to a number. Quick background on the, on the history of IRAs, where IRAs began, how they were started. Back in 1974, Congress uh, and was rewrite, rewriting the rules as it pertained uh, mainly to pension plans under the ERISA Act. At that time, there were a couple issues with pension plans that the Congress was looking to address. One, if you worked for a company that offered a pension, a lot of times when you left that company and were no longer employed in that company, your pension stayed behind and you'd receive that benefit when you reached retirement age, but there's really nothing you could do in the interim to grow that account uh, to increase ultimately the benefit that you would get uh, later in life. So a lot of people were unhappy that when they left, simply their pension stayed there and they really couldn't do anything about it. Uh, additionally, a lot of people didn't work for companies that offered pensions. So if you were an individual on your own, either as a self-employed individual or just working for a company that didn't offer you retirement benefit, you were at somewhat of a disadvantage to those people who did work for a company that offered them a pension plan or other type of retirement account. Uh, so in 1974, as part of the uh, RISA law, Congress creates the individual retirement arrangement that addressed these two concerns. Individuals who left employers and had their pension plans uh, still with those employers, once they were no longer uh, employed by that particular employer, they were allowed now to take that money and roll it over into an individual retirement account to which they could then control into a variety of different types of investments. And also individuals who uh, you know, had earned income, didn't work for a company that offered a retirement plan, could now establish their own IRA account and make their own annual contributions each year and have the same type of tax-deferred growth 
that other people were enjoying in their retirement accounts. So the ERISA Act acknowledged those two issues and resolved those two issues by creating the IRA account. Another seminal year in IRA history was 1997, when as part of the Taxpayer Relief Act of that year, Roth IRAs were created. This was they're named after the senator from Delaware who advocated uh, their creation, but a Roth IRA came into existence and has become really a preferred uh, and very popular route for retirement plan investing. Individuals that put money into a Roth IRA do so with post-tax dollars, and the gains within that Roth IRA account, ultimately the earnings will come out tax-free to their to the owners of the Roth IRAs when they reach retirement. So it allows for a much more powerful uh, way of investing. With traditional IRAs and regular 401ks, when you invest in those funds and or make contributions to those accounts, uh, you may get a tax uh, write-off for this particular year. The money goes in tax-deferred, but ultimately you will pay tax in the future. So you're basically paying tax on the plant as opposed to the seed. And with the Roth IRA, that is reversed. You're paying tax only on the amount you put in, but whatever you gain and earn within that account is going to ultimately be tax-free to you. Now, what types of accounts can be self-directed? Uh, any type of IRA, whether it's a traditional, a Roth, a SEP, or a simple IRA, can certainly be self-directed. You just have to have the right custodian uh, and administrator to handle that type of account. And again, that is the job that we serve uh, as the administrator of these types of accounts. A Charles Schwab or Fidelity could offer you uh, different investment options if they wished, uh, but currently they don't, and it's really not their business model to do so. But any type of IRA, wherever it is currently held, can be self-directed as long as you move that money to a custodian like Advanta who can handle that type of account. Uh, in addition to IRAs, another type of account we have at Advanta is the individual 401k or profit sharing plan. If you're a sole proprietor or if you own a business that you don't have any employees, you have the ability to create your own 401k plan and take advantage of the larger contribution limits that the 401k offers over an IRA account. Um, our plan is specially suited for these uh, individuals because they don't have employees. Once you are owning a business and you have employees that would qualify for a 401k plan, you have to do various types of discrimination testing and other things to keep that plan in compliance year to year. And that's not something that we can perform. You would need to seek a third-party administrator for those types of 401ks. But if you are a sole proprietor, you can establish an individual 401k plan. Our document is well suited for that. And you wouldn't have to worry about doing any types of discrimination testing. And certainly once this 401k plan is established, you could then self-direct it into real estate and other investments that we'll talk about later. Two other types of accounts that can be self-directed, the education savings account and also the health savings account. These aren't retirement accounts per se, but they have the same, some of the same tax benefits that the IRAs do, um, but obviously the monies are used for different purposes rather than for retirement. The monies are used for paying for higher education for either yourself or, or a dependent or paying for health expenses uh, as well. So again, those accounts aren't retirement accounts, but they follow the same rules and have many of the same tax benefits as do the IRAs. Now looking at the traditional IRA, anyone with earned income can create a traditional IRA. It doesn't matter how much you make. As long as you have earned income, you can contribute to a traditional IRA. And in most cases, the contribution to a traditional IRA gives you a deduction on your current tax bill. So if I make a $5,000 contribution to my traditional IRA, I'm going to get a write-off for that $5,000 on my 1040 that I file for that year. The money as it's invested in the traditional IRA grows tax deferred. So as you invest and reinvest those funds, you don't pay taxes. But when you do take retirement, when you take the funds out of the traditional IRA at a later date, you are taxed on the money at that time. Now, any former 401k, pension plan, defined benefit plan in general, those plans can all be rolled over into a traditional IRA without any tax consequence. So Kind of going back to 1974, we had these people with the pension plans. They wanted something to do. Um, they, if they take the money out, they would have been taxed on it. But instead, they just simply roll it into a traditional IRA and now have a multitude of different investment options. Even 401k plans these days are lim more limited. You might only have so many mutual funds, so many stocks, uh, other types of investments to pick from. You move it out into an IRA, you have all kinds of different things, including the things we'll talk about today with a self-directed IRA. 
Now, some of the distribution rules with a traditional IRA, uh, you have to be over the age of 59 and a half um, to take a distribution from a traditional IRA without any penalty. Uh, any money taken out prior to that time, not only are they included in your income, they also are hit with a 10% early withdrawal penalty. That's the IRS and the government's way of encouraging you to leave that money in there for retirement. They don't want you touching it early. Now with the traditional IRA, again, you're going to be taxed at ordinary income after age 59 and a half, so you have all those years of tax deferral. Um, and at age 70 and a half, you're required to take out a minimum amount each year. That amount is generally figured using the overall value of your account along with your life expectancy tables to come up with what your RMD will be for that particular year. Also at age 70 and a half, you can no longer make contributions into the traditional IRA. Uh, so it's kind of at that point, you have what's in there. You can certainly grow that account through your investments, but you can't add any new contributions at that time. Now if you're under 59 and a half, there are a couple of exceptions for the 10% uh, the penalty that is imposed. Uh, a few of them are listed here, whether it's higher education uh, expenses, you're disabled, or you're a first-time home buyer. There are a few others as well that you can take money out of a traditional IRA and not pay the 10%. You will, though, however, be taxed on those distributions. The Roth IRA, again, one of the more popular IRAs since its inception back in 1997 because of its tax-free status, basically, that it has. It's a very powerful tool for making investments and seeing all of the earnings of those investments ultimately be tax-free to you. Uh, in general, anyone can have a Roth IRA account. It's the contributions that are what are limited to a Roth IRA. If you make too much money, you, can't, you may not be able to contribute each year directly into the account. But if you have a Roth IRA already, you can still continue to grow that account and, and make it grow tax-free. Now again, as long as you meet a couple of uh, distribution requirements, and we'll discuss those on the next slide, monies earned within a Roth IRA are completely tax-free. So as you invest and reinvest, you're not paying taxes on the money in the Roth. And then when you take the money out in retirement, it comes out to you completely tax-free as well. So again, you're paying tax only on what you put in to the account not what ultimately comes out. So contributions into a Roth IRA, you do not get a tax deduction on, your, on that current year's 1040, but ultimately you're not going to pay any taxes going forward on those funds. There's no mandatory withdrawals. The IRS does not require you to withdraw money from a Roth IRA. There's no tax revenue for them to collect. So it doesn't matter if you ultimately take the money out of the Roth IRA or not, or just simply leave it to your heirs for them to distribute. You can also make contributions after age 70 and a half. And another thing is that anyone can contribute uh, to a traditional IRA, and anyone is allowed to convert to a Roth IRA. Now, doing a conversion is taking money into a traditional IRA account, moving it into the Roth, and electing to pay the tax on the money as it goes from the traditional to the Roth. So I said a few minutes ago that you couldn't contribute to a Roth IRA, but you could always contribute to the traditional IRA and then immediately convert it to the Roth, which in a sense gets around that rule of, of if you make too much money, you can't contribute. By doing a contribution to a traditional IRA and then subsequently converting it to a Roth, you basically achieve the same thing. Now with distributing from a Roth IRA, again, if you're under 59 and a half, the same rule as a traditional IRA applies as a 10% penalty for early withdrawal. Uh, the same exceptions uh, apply, the first-time home buyer, the disability, uh, the higher education, et cetera. The same exceptions apply to that 10% penalty. But once you're over 59 and a half and you've had a Roth IRA for at least five years, the money comes out to you completely tax-free. There is no um, more money is due. And that five-year clock actually starts when you open up your very first Roth IRA. So if in 1998 you had started a Roth IRA with $50 in it, and didn't do anything else with it uh, until this year, and then you started making contributions and making money, your five-year clock has already run. So that's kind of one thing people think, if I'm starting a new Roth IRA, I'm going to have to restart that clock. I don't want to do that. The truth is your five-year clock has already started. A couple of the, uh, em I call them employer-based accounts, your SEP IRA, your simple IRA, and also that individual 401k that I touched on earlier, these are all special plans that are designed for small business owners or sole proprietors. Now a SEP and a simple IRAs can be easier to set up 
uh, if you do have a company with employees and you do want to include them as part of your retirement uh, offerings, the step in the simple uh, enable you to contribute some money in for them, them to actually put some of their own funds in as well. Uh, but it will have lower administrative costs in offering a full-blown 401k. As I mentioned, with a 401k, you have to do various types of discrimination testing and other things to keep your plan in compliance. With the SEP and the SIMPLE, as long as you're making the contributions you're supposed to make for them, you can offer the SEP and SIMPLE and not have nearly the administrative costs that the 401k does. With the SEP and the SIMPLE, uh, again, you can include certain employees. There are some limitations on who you have to include, uh, but when you have the individual 401k through Advanta, you, have to, you can't have any employees who work more than 1,000 hours a year. Uh, once they reach that status on, on a, you know, hour 1,001, they have to now be included in the 401k, and our plan does not allow for employees. It's a very simplified solo or individual 401k. The advantage the individual K has, though, is it does offer the largest possible contribution based on your income. Um, you don't need as much income to make and meet that match uh, each year. Uh, also, the 401K offers a unique feature, uh, and that is the Roth option. With any 401K plan, you have two components. One, the employee, even if you're, if you're, even if you're the owner, you're also an employee of your own company you can defer up to a certain amount of your salary each year into the 401k plan. And the second component is as the, the company then does a profit sharing match. Well, that employee contribution each year can actually be designated as a Roth option if your plan allows for it, and certainly ours does. What this means is rather than putting in five or $6,000 each year into a Roth IRA, if you're a sole proprietor, you could start an individual 401k plan and actually put in seventeen or $22,000 a year into the Roth 401k plan for your salary deferral. With any of these plans, I usually recommend talking with your CPA, talking with your accountant, whoever handles your business finances. They can look at the numbers that you have for your company, what you're trying to accomplish for your retirement goals, and let you know which one of these plans makes the most sense, whether it's the SEP, the SIMPLE, or in some cases the individual 401k plan. Here are the contribution limits as of 2012 uh, for all of these types of accounts. For a traditional and a Roth IRA, you, you can contribute up to $5,000 a year. Uh, if you're over 50, they give you an additional $1,000 catch-up for a total of $6,000 per year. With a SEP IRA, there's a formula involved, but the maximum contribution each year is $50,000. And that's usually arrived at as either 25% of W-2 or 20% of Schedule C income, up to a maximum of $50,000 a year. And the simple IRA is a little bit like a 401k. It has some salary deferral features, up to $11,500 a year. Again, a little bit more if you're over 50. Plus, the employer can throw in up to 3% as a match. The education savings account is $2,000 per year per child. The HSA has different amounts based on whether or not the health plan, the HSA eligible health plan, is either an individual or a family plan. And the 401k, again, as I mentioned, there's two components. One is the salary deferral, uh, which is 17000 if you're under the age of 50. And again, that's the portion that can be designated as a Roth contribution. So you can put, if you're under the age of 50 and you own your own company with your own 401k, you can put in $17,000 of funds in a Roth 401k uh, each year. But the maximum uh, salary deferral plus the employer's match is around the same amount as a SEP IRA, but if you look at the numbers and actually sit down on how that is calculated, you can get to that maximum figure much more quickly with an individual K versus having a SEP IRA. Now in order to contribute to those accounts, with the exception of the ESA, the ESA is not included in this slide, but the rest of the accounts, the traditional, the Roth, the SEPs, 401k, you must have earned income as defined by the IRS in order to make a contribution. And earned income typically is reported on either a W-2 or a Schedule C. Social Security, alimony, uh, other types of passive income like rents and dividends are not considered earned by the IRS for the purposes of making an annual contribution. So even if you're a landlord and you have 10 properties and you're dealing with uh, your tenants and the calls in the middle of the night, um, that rental income you're accruing is not considered earned, at least by the IRS. I think oh, everyone else would disagree that you're certainly earning 
that income, but for the purposes of an IRA contribution, that wouldn't count. The good thing is though, you only need to have earned income to the extent of the contribution that you are making. So in order to make a five or $6,000 Roth contribution each year, you only need to have five or $6,000 of earned income in order to justify that contribution. So a part-time job um, for someone who is semi-retired, that, that would certainly qualify. Uh, if you have high school students, younger kids who are actually working after school, you can convince them they can actually put their money into a Roth IRA at even a much younger age and have that much longer for that money to grow tax-free. Now the rules we just discussed for the past few minutes, those rules are no different whether the IRA account is an account at a brokerage firm or at a bank or if it's a self-directed IRA here at Advanta. What separates a self-directed IRA from maybe more traditional IRAs are the investment options that you would have. Most IRAs are currently with banks and brokerage firms who offer you limited investment options. They are sell selling you CDs, money markets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, um, that's their business model, but IRS regulations actually allow you to invest in a much broader range of investments that something they don't, aren't willing to hold at a brokerage firm, but something we can certainly specialize in and assist you with here at Advanta. Some of the types of investments that we see our clients hold include various types of real estate, whether it's raw land, actual vacant lots, rental properties, rehab projects, uh, com even some commercial property uh, a few of our clients hold within their IRA accounts. Related to real estate, we also see a lot of different types of lending, uh, whether it's a, a note that's secured by a mortgage, an unsecured note, options on real estate or assignable contracts even, uh, tax liens, tax certificates, uh, even some equity participation. Uh, 80 to 85 percent of our business is probably real estate related, whether it's the IRA owning actual physical dirt or physical property, or the IRA has lent money to some third party and has that loan secured by real estate or you know, by a mortgage or maybe even a tax lien on that particular property. In addition to the real estate assets, we also see individuals investing in LLCs, private partnerships, uh, even some precious metals, gold, actually holding the physical gold and silver as opposed to buying an interest in an ETF it is permissible with an IRA to actually go and buy the physical gold or silver American Eagles as the investment within your IRA account. We also see some Forex uh, trading, private stock, just a lot of different things that you can invest in with your IRA that a lot of people are not aware of. They might even be investing already outside the IRA. Think of people who maybe have some gold and silver Eagles that they're already holding on to. Personally, don't even realize that their IRA funds can be invested as well into those types of assets. And the reason is because most people are familiar with banks and brokerage firms that don't allow these types of investments within their accounts because they've made the decision that they're not willing to hold or administer those accounts. In fact, when the IRS was making uh, the IRS take a step back, the IRS actually never made a list of permissible investments and lists all the different mutual funds or stocks or real estate, private lending, etc. The IRS simply has a list of things you cannot do within your retirement account, prohibited transactions. There are two types of investments that you cannot make within an IRA. One is life insurance. Your IRA can't own life insurance. And the IRA cannot purchase collectibles. And collectibles are usually defined as you know, antiques, alcohol, artwork, certain stamps and coins. And again, coins depends on the type of coin because as I mentioned, the gold and silver eagles are permitted within an IRA account. So depends on, again, the type of coin. These, the coins that are prohibited more are the, due to the rarity of the coin, not to the value of the actual metal in the coins, which is the basis for a gold or silver American Eagle. But we can always get you a list of those types of coins if you're looking at investing. In addition to life insurance and collectibles, which usually we don't get a lot of questions on that. It's fairly straightforward. The other big area where the IRS limits your investment options and who you can deal with is that there are certain disqualified persons that your IRA cannot transact with. It's important to remember when we're talking about these disqualified persons that your IRA is a separate legal entity. It is its own legal entity separate from yourself. And as such, it's certain people that the IRA cannot transact with. And that would include yourself as the IRA owner, your spouse, 
any lineal ascendants of the IRA owner, so parents and grandparents of the IRA owner are prohibited from transacting with the IRA, as well as lineal descendants, kids, grandkids, and also any spouse of a lineal descendant. So a daughter-in-law or son-in-law would also be prohibited from transacting with your IRA account. Additionally, the IRS extends that to any business or entity that is owned or controlled by one of the above individuals as well. So a couple of quick examples. If you had a rental property that you owned personally, you can't sell that property to your IRA because that would involve a transaction between the IRA and you as a disqualified person. You cannot use your IRA funds to lend money to a child for the purchase of their home or for an investment into their business. That would also be prohibited. And you don't get around those rules by simply lending money to a daughter-in-law or a son-in-law instead because they would be prohibited as well. And that's usually the arena where we're going to get most of our questions day to day and where you might have your own questions is what is prohibited when you're involving these types of individuals. And in general, uh, the prohibited transaction is when the IRA involves or the, it's a, the IRA is involved with a disqualified person and a transaction between the two. And I usually define transaction as an, an agreement or arrangement where there's two competing interests, where the IRA and the disqualified person are on opposite sides of a contract, whether the IRA is a buyer, the disqualified person is a seller, or the IRA is a landlord, the disqualified person is a tenant. Those are all kind of adversarial relationships, borrower-lender, those similar types of arrangements. That is what is prohibited uh, as a transaction between the disqualified person and the IRA. What is acceptable is partnering with the disqualified person and kind of picturing some of those same relationships. It is possible for your IRA to go along with a disqualified person in making a particular investment. The most common example we have, for instance, would be a husband's IRA and a wife's IRA, both being used to buy property from some third party. So in that instance, both of the IRA accounts are buyers and some third party unrelated is the seller. That is acceptable. Um, if it's your own personal funds, you know, I have some money in an IRA and some money personally, I can use those funds in conjunction to buy a property together and share the income and expenses accordingly. The key thing when you're doing partnering with a disqualified person, though, is you have to be careful that you never change the percentages of ownership between the two because in that case you likely would resolve in a prohibited transaction at that time. But we certainly have many people who have invested their IRA funds alongside a disqualified person and have done just fine with it. Some other transactions, uh, prohibited transaction considerations to, to be aware of. When I mentioned the disqualified persons a couple slides ago, I did not mention brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, etc., because technically they are not disqualified persons. The IRS is okay with you transacting with a brother and sister with using your IRA account. That is a permissible transaction because they are not disqualified. However, one word of caution that we give to you is you probably would want to deal, if you're going to deal with those family members, do so on an arm's length fair market transaction, kind of on a fair market basis. If you're lending money to a brother or sister and charging them much below market rate of interest and they're in turn are paying you back sporadically or not paying you back at all, the IRS would wonder what other arrangement is going on here. And you're not allowed to get any current benefit from your IRA. So you can't live in a property you own. Uh, you're not supposed to do things out of the goodness of your heart. Your IRA is an investment opportunity, and the goal of your IRA account is to grow money. So if you're going to deal with brothers and sisters or other family members, you want to be doing so on a basis that you could justify to the IRS. Using a middleman between the IRA and a disqualified person, it's called the step transaction doctrine. So you can't, if you own a rental property in your personal name, you can't sell it to your IRA. Uh, you don't get around that by selling it first to a friend who then in turn sells it to your IRA account. That is called a step transaction doctrine, meaning you kind of took everything out one step, but it's still going to be prohibited for the IRS. And the, really the question in the step transaction doctrine, the way the IRS applies it, is what is the intent? If my intent is to sell it to a third party, for them to turn around and sell it to my IRA, then that's going to be prohibited. Um, if I sell it to a third party, and then five years go by, they, they are in turn selling the property again, and I come back and buy it with my IRA, that's probably okay because you didn't have the intent originally to do that. But 
Um, most situations when we're hearing people discuss this is using a middleman just to get around that rule, and that's not going to be permitted. I mentioned using your IRA owned asset for your own current benefit. A couple of quick examples. If your IRA owns real estate, you cannot live in it. You cannot rent it to yourself. Um, any disqualified persons cannot live in that property. Uh, the IRS deems you to be getting a current benefit. The benefits are supposed to be accruing to the IRA through rental income or through other growth within the account. Uh, they don't want you, in a sense, double dipping, in their opinion, of using that asset while it's owned within the IRA. Lastly, providing sweat equity to your IRA-owned asset. For instance, you can't do the maintenance on the work. That kind of brings up the considerations we've talked about. If your IRA is, owns a property and is hiring you to do the work, now you have a transaction between yourself and the IRA account. You know, the IRA is the owner of the property. You personally are the contractor. That's a problem. Even if you didn't get paid for the work, that is also an issue because now you're making a contribution of labor to your IRA. You're enhancing the value of your IRA asset through your own work, and the IRS does not permit contributions of anything other than cash to your account. So very short, if your IRA is going to own real estate, it needs to hire third parties to actually do that work and maintain that particular asset. What are the benefits of self-direction, though? Certainly being able to choose the investments that you're want to invest in something that you know and understand. A lot of people don't have a great understanding of mutual funds, of the stock market, etc., but they do understand interest on a loan and how that generates money or how owning a real estate, a piece of real estate would generate cash flow each month or maybe investing in a private placement has a potential to, to yield a much larger return than what they're currently investing in. And the, one of the biggest things about self-direction is that you have that freedom to choose what it is that you're investing in. You're not pigeonholed into a specific type of investment. You actually can go out and find something that your broker or your financial advisor wouldn't ordinarily find for you, and you can then invest in that. And actually, if you think your return would be better, then obviously it gives you the freedom to do so. Uh, another big reason people like to self-direct is that in many cases, especially with real estate, you're investing in tangible assets. I bought a rental property. Yes, the value might go down from what I bought it at, uh, whatever price I paid, but it's not going anywhere. The property is there. Um, when you invest in a company or a mutual fund or other types of investments, uh, you can't always control as well what's going on, especially if you're invested in a stock in a company. If the company does poorly, the stock loses most of its value. There's nothing really for you to do about that. You're left holding kind of worthless paper asset. But investing in something tangible that you can see gives people a reassurance that their investment is actually real, and it's there, and they know exactly what it is that they have as their investment. Kind of walk through some case studies now to show you the interplay between the client, uh, you potentially as the IRA owner, and what Advanta offers us as far as a service and what the different relationships are, as well as these case studies will give you a couple examples of what actual clients have done and showing you how self-direction can work. In this first case study, we have Paul who has a modest Roth IRA account, and he's interested in investing some of that money into real estate and specifically looking at foreclosures. And in this current market, a lot of people are taking advantages of short sales and foreclosures and getting property far below what they feel the actual value of the property is. And in this example, Paul finds a house that he can purchase, uh, he believes, for $40,000, and then maybe put in an additional 8000 or so of work into that property before he can get it ready to rent. And after he gets a rent, he's projecting he could cash flow about $400 a month after repairs, which depending on what type of property is, you know, that still could be kind of a, a low estimate of the cash flow. As far as the duties of the client versus uh, Advanta, it's going to be up to Paul. He's obviously going to open and fund his account by filling out our paperwork, transferring money from his current Roth IRA over to his Roth IRA at Advanta. He finds an investment property. In this case, he's the one that found that $40,000 house. That's not something we're going to assist him in doing or encourage him to particularly do. That's going to be solely up to, to Paul. He's going to decide what he's going to offer and make that offer to purchase. And he submits a form to Advanta called a purchase authorization form telling us what it is that he's buying. For instance, this property, he would give us the address, the contract price of around $40,000, and 
And more specifically, he's going to give us who the title company is that is handling this transaction. Our job is then to contact the title company and make sure all the documents are properly prepared in the name of Paul's IRA account. It is imperative and very important that the deed to the property be made out to Paul's IRA. If it was made out to Paul personally, and just in his simple name, and he uses IRA funds to pay for it, the IRS would deem that to be a distribution to Paul, and depending on how old he is and other, some other circumstances, that could be taxable to him. More importantly, though, any of the gains he was anticipating to be tax-free within his Roth would not be because he would own this asset personally. So it's important, and again, our job is to make sure that this asset is titled in the name of the IRA account. Before we sign any documents on behalf of the IRA, we'll send everything to Paul for him to review and approve, and then ultimately sign the documents, wire the funds for closing, and the purchase is then complete. And now on Paul's IRA statement, rather than showing mutual funds or stocks, it will show him owning this particular property. After the property has been purchased, it's important again that expel expenses get paid out of the IRA account. If your IRA owns real estate or owns an asset that is incurring expenses, the IRA needs to pay for those expenses, whether it's maintenance, uh, the taxes, maybe the repairs that Paul was talking about, the $8,000 or so to get it ready to rent. That all must be paid directly from the IRA, and Paul would get the bills, send them to us, and then we get them paid out of the cash that's held within his IRA account. Additionally, once he gets his property rented, the tenant each month would mail the rent check directly back to Advanta, and we deposit it into his IRA account. So at the end of each month, he'd have a clear record of money in and money out of his account, and that's the job we're serving as the administrator of his account. Now looking at a couple of different exit strategies that Paul might have for this property, certainly if he just continued to hold the account uh, and didn't want to you know, get rid of it or do anything else with it, he's going to get basically a 10% return back to his IRA each year if he's able to get that $400 a month cash flow. Certainly any more that cash flow that he gets month to month, that's going to be that much higher return that he gets within his IRA. Uh, he could certainly sell the property. You know, uh, mentioned that we have clients who do rehab projects. If he had bought this property, got it fixed up, and someone came along and wanted to offer him more, um, he can certainly sell the property, and then whatever process or what, what profits he makes and proceeds from the sale are going to come back into his Roth IRA tax-free, and now he has hopefully more money to work with in pursuing different investments. And the last option, he could sell the property for a gain, get 20% down, have actually as the seller, take 20% down back into the Roth IRA, and then his IRA could hold the balance in a form of a mortgage. Um, in this example, those are the terms I use, he ends up getting $16,000 of his initial investment back, so he's got one-third of his initial investment already paid back, plus he's got a, a five-year balloon note that's paying uh, $4,500 a year or so, which based on the amount of money that's still out there is quite a good return coming back in his Roth IRA each year. And that's kind of a, a unique strategy that I've seen some of our clients do in buying property and selling and then holding back the mortgage. If your IRA is short on funds, for instance, you don't have enough in the IRA to actually buy the property for cash, you do have a couple of different options. Uh, one is the partnering technique I mentioned earlier. Your IRA can combine with a spouse, uh, personal funds, other people's IRAs, and buy a property as tenants in common. And whatever percentage your IRA owns, then your IRA would pay that portion of expenses and receive that portion of income back into the IRA each year. Sometimes we've had clients be able to make their annual contribution of that five or $6,000 for a traditional IRA or much more for the other types of accounts, make the contribution, and then be able to close on a particular property. The last option is it is possible for an IRA to borrow money. Now, it's not often that we see this happen, but it is possible for an IRA to make a down payment and for the IRA to borrow funds with a non-recourse loan. Essentially, the non-recourse loan means that the bank or the lender is going to lend money to the IRA account, and you can't, and the individual IRA owner will not personally guarantee the note. That would be a prohibited transaction that we talked about earlier for you to pledge your own good name and credit for the benefit of your IRA. So the loan is to the IRA. The IRA has made the down payment, and it's not a recourse because the bank has no recourse against you or the IRA. They can simply foreclose on the property. That's their only option 
if there is a non-payment of that loan. Again, it's not too common that we see this. Most regular banks are, don't participate in these types of loans. Uh, the institutions that do are usually looking for 30 to 40% down in order to make the non-recourse loan. But that being said, there are some national lenders who do this type of lending. Uh, we can certainly give you their names if you need them. One other option that a lot of people don't even think about is seller financing. You might have a seller who's trying to get rid of a property, but they're willing to accept a down payment and have your IRA just continue to make monthly payments to them each year. And you know, if they have to take the property back, they take the property back. It would still need to be a non-recourse loan, but you might find sellers who would happily take your 20% down, um, and if you don't pay, they'll simply foreclose. Our next example of, a, of an investment is an option, and this could also really be read this example as an assignable contract as well. Uh, but we have Olivia who has some money in mutual funds, but is looking at doing assignable contracts or options within her IRA. She doesn't have a lot, so she can't maybe actually go out and purchase a property, but she's seen the potential that options and assignable contracts have in getting a bigger bang for her buck. And her transaction is laid out as follows. She purchases an option from John. Her IRA gives $5,000 to John for the right to buy his house for $65,000 at any point during the next two years. So her IRA has an interest in this property, and she actually records the option so John can't sell the property without first satisfying her option. But she goes out and finds a buyer who's willing to pay $85,000 for his house, and then puts the two together, basically puts the end user and end buyer together with John, um, and the new buyer will pay her $20,000 for her rights in the option, and then they buy the property for the sixty-five. dollars So John gets the $65,000 he was happy with to get out of his house. The new buyer has the actual house, and Olivia's IRA gets the $20,000 back as an assignment fee. And again, that could be structured as either an option contract or maybe just getting a property under contract um, and assigning it to some other person who's willing to take over and perform on the contract. Now aside from the direct ownership of real estate, where the IRA actually owns the, the dirt or the mortar of the actual property, the most common thing we see in an IRA is some type of lending. Um, it can take a lot of different forms. Usually the most common thing is going to be a, a mortgage where the IRA lends money and has that loan secured by a piece of real estate. Uh, but it can also be an unsecured loan, a simple promissory note, certainly more risky, but it is allowable as long as the borrower is not a disqualified person. Uh, we've seen people do some joint venturing, some equity participation. Regardless of the terms or, or the actual what structure that the IRA takes, what the, the loan to the IRA takes, it's always important to remember that when you're doing private lending with your IRA, your IRA is basically the bank. It gets to determine all of the terms of the loan. If you're, someone's coming to borrow money from your IRA, you get to decide how much money you're willing to lend them, what interest rates you're going to charge, when, the, when you want this money paid back, you know, how long is the loan going to be out there for. Is it amortized or is it an interest-only loan? Are there any equity participation terms? It's, your IRA, again, is similar to that bank. If I walked into a bank tomorrow to apply for a car loan or for a personal loan or for a home loan, they're going to run my credit, look at my collateral, and tell me what they're willing to lend to me on that particular property and what the terms are going to be and if it's your IRA account, you can certainly do the same. The last strategy we'll talk about uh, is a little more controversial. And this is kind of what I mentioned at the very beginning that there can be gray areas when it comes to IRA investing that we really can't wade into. Uh, we can only make you aware of the rules and of the issues, but it's up to you to make that determination. And one of the most the popular, or I'd say the most common areas where we run into this issue in these gray areas is in the form of LLCs and private partnerships. More specifically, the example we'll talk about here is the checkbook control IRA. Very simple, the checkbook control LLC or checkbook control IRA is usually set up where the IRA owns 100% of an LLC, so the IRA owner gets this artificial LLC set up, and the IRA is the sole member, meaning the IRA is the one that contributes all of the cash into this particular LLC. And in most cases with the checkbook control, the IRA owner personally is named as the manager of the LLC. This gives the IRA owner the authority to sign contracts, make investments, write checks, etc. on behalf of the LLC, 
which essentially is using the IRA funds to do so. That's where you get the term checkbook control because your IRA is invested in this LLC that you have the checkbook for. Due to the prohibited transactions and disqualified persons we talked about earlier, we really advise you and encourage you to speak with an attorney if you're going to pursue this type of arrangement. Um, if you're going to be the manager, there's a lot of gray areas to whether or not that is prohibited within the eyes of the IRS. There are companies that offer kind of a one-stop shop where you can set up the IRA with them and you can set up the LLC and they help get you started. They charge you several thousand dollars for that type of arrangement. I can tell you there's no secret formula, special LLC that these individuals or these companies offer um, over what you could do with your own you know, local attorney or maybe somebody else who's, whose name we could give you if you're, if you're interested in pursuing that route. The checkbook control industry is based off the case of Swanson v. Commissioner, and this legal citation is here on this slide as well for you to look it up. Um, we will make this type of investment, and you actually if you, if you get the LLC set up, we will sign the operating agreement on behalf of the IRA and send money to the LLC, but which you, we do have you sign off on a disclaimer. And again, I'd really encourage you to look into this type of arrangement, really get some opinions on it before you just sign up, because there are... Again, it's a gray area whether or not you can be that manager of the LLC. It might be much safer to choose someone who's not disqualified, you know, a non-disqualified person, to be the manager of your LLC and try to avoid that issue altogether. But obviously, a lot of people want to have their own control, have the checkbook under their name. But this is not something, unfortunately, the case of Swanson v. Commissioner uh, kind of paved the way for this type of arrangement and this type of entity. But there were a lot of questions that were left unanswered. So we consider this to be in a gray area of IRS rules. Because it's not clearly prohibited, we do process it as long as you sign off on a disclaimer. Certainly the advantages of having a checkbook control IRA, um, one is some anonymity. Uh, if your IRA owns real estate simply in the name of the IRA, then it might be titled as Advanced IRA Services for benefit of Paul Smith's IRA account. So your name is actually on the deed alongside advances for your IRA account. When you're investing through an LLC, it's simply the name of the LLC is actually on the deed. If you're only concerned about anonymity, we can title property by leaving your name out or using your initials and simply using your IRA account number. But really the main reason that people like the checkbook control IRA LLC is the control. Writing those checks is needed. If you're buying properties at auction sales, or you're making a lot of different quick investments where it's not feasible, it's not practical to contact Advanta to get a check cut from our, your account or to get us all the documentation. Having everything in the LLC makes it much easier to get those different kinds of deals done. You can also hold more assets and pay lower fees. We consider the LLC simply one asset of the IRA account and subject only to one asset fee per year. Uh, if that LLC in turn owns three or four or five or maybe even more different types of assets, you're still only paying us one fee for the LLC asset. That specifically, that especially comes into play and can assist if you're doing a lot of smaller, uh, numerous smaller loans or smaller investments, the LLC can certainly save you on fees there and make it more practical for making those types of investments. Now certainly some of the disadvantages of the checkbook control IRA, there's a lack of oversight uh, once uh, by us as the administrator. I mean, we'll send money to your LLC, and once a year you're required to report to us a value for that LLC. But throughout the year, you don't have to come back to us for permission on doing a bunch of different types of investments. And depending on who you are, that's either a great thing or not such a good thing. A lot of people take our seminars, they listen to us, they read the rules involved, but when it comes time to make transactions, they might have forgotten things that were prohibited. You, know, you can't buy collectibles, or you can't lend money to a son or daughter. And when the money is in the LLC and they have the checkbook, it's very easy just to simply make that investment without really fully thinking it through. There's no oversight uh, by us checking each particular transaction. And so you can engage in a prohibited transaction fairly easily because of that lack of oversight. Also, improper record keeping. If you're running your, all your rentals through this LLC that your IRA owns, you should be keeping pretty good books of money in and money out of the LLC. If the IRS were to ever audit your LLC for the activity that's going on 
for your IRA account within that LLC. You should be able to, and they're probably going to be upset if you can't document where every cent went. Um, and that's something that if you did just simply own the properties within your IRA, our annual account statement will show all the monies in and out of the IRA account for that particular property. And again, you have the gray area if uh, a disqualified person is going to act as manager. It's one other thing to consider. That being said, we certainly have a lot of people who have done this. I've spoken with attorneys and gotten their opinion. There are some attorneys out there who don't see any problem with this setup. Um, there are some attorneys and people that say, I would never do this setup. So it really depends on your philosophies, uh, your personality, maybe you know, the attorneys you're using, and getting their full opinion once they explain it to you and see if that makes sense or not. Uh, but the steps of doing a checkbook control IRA LLC are fairly simple. Again, in this case, Steve is going to open up and fund his IRA by transferring money from another account. He works with an attorney to create a new LLC. It is important that the LLC be a brand new one. If the LLC was something he already had in existence, uh, I even get calls where people say, I have an empty LLC. I formed an LLC a couple years ago, bought some property, sold it, but the LLC is still active. You can't use that LLC. That one was owned by you personally and is still owned by you personally, even if there's nothing in the LLC account. So when you're doing a checkbook control IRA LLC, it must be a brand new entity. In this case, the attorney creates the LLC and names Steve as manager of that LLC on with the state's website. However, the document that we need to see at Advanta is the operating agreement for the LLC. This is different from the LLC articles. The operating agreement will list who the members are, who the managers are, how the LLC is to be run, etc. And within that operating agreement, the member would need to read Advanta IRA Services LLC, FBO, Steve's IRA number such and such. And that's how it should read in the operating agreement. We will actually sign the operating agreement on behalf of the IRA once Steve has marked it as approved for us. Steve would open up a bank account for this LLC for us to then send money from the IRA into the LLC bank account. He's going to have a couple other documents, including that disclaimer I mentioned earlier, to sign for this investment. But once he's approved the documents, we'll wire funds to the account or cut a check to the account. And now that the LLC has been funded and has cash, Steve can write checks, sign contracts, etc., in the name of the LLC, and make all those investments basically in and out of his IRA. The income and, exp and expenses related to those assets would then flow in and out of the LLC, not the IRA. So again, it's important there for Steve to keep good records and showing the money in and out of the account in case he's ever audited because it's not coming back through us where the records would be clear. Getting started is fairly simple. It's a matter of opening account and funding it by transferring money from a current IRA or rolling over from a former employer's plan into the IRA account and then choosing your particular investment, whether it's real estate, private loans, tax liens, Forex accounts, accounts receivable. There's a lot of different things you can do within the self-directed IRA as, we, as we've demonstrated and gone over today, but even that doesn't cover, we didn't cover the full range of different investment options that are out there. And for most of our clients, they come to us having already decided, maybe not on the specific investment, but the type of investment they want to make within their retirement account and come to us to facilitate it through their IRA account. We offer seminars, classes. Uh, you can always call us for more information. Be happy to walk, that, walk, through you, walk through with you different transactions, whether it's you, know, you have questions on, okay, once I get this set up, how does it work? How do you process checks? How do I follow my account? Do I have online access? Things like that. You can please call us uh, at 727-581-9853. My contact information is here on the last slide. You can always visit our website as well at AdvantaIRA.com for a list of upcoming events, other great articles, our blog articles. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well uh, to get as much information about self-directed IRAs as you can. Again, the important thing is to remember that you do have the freedom to direct your IRA account into all of these different types of investments. You just have to have the right administrator to do so, and that is, that is the role that we serve. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Please stand by.